Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Malu Dumim in Israel. The subject of God is one which people tend to be reluctant to bring up in conversation. People avoid it like the plague, ranking it with repulsive odors and heavy philosophy as matters to stay away from in friendly conversation. Everyone knows something about God, even if they don't believe in God. They have what to say about God, even if they won't say it. It hasn't always been this way. In the not-so-distant past, people had no problem talking about God. It was on everybody's lips at all times. God was taken to be an essential aspect of reality, like the earth or DNA, so there was no reason to avoid the subject. While it was true that not everybody had the same idea about what God actually was, this touchy matter was dealt with by sticking around people who shared the same religious beliefs. As long as that condition was fulfilled, there was no reason to not discuss something that everybody agreed was there. Nowadays, it frequently seems that only in strictly religious circles that God is a safe topic. Even there, it may be on its way out. Other than standard expressions that everybody uses, like thank God, there seems to be an almost intentional plan to remove God from everyday life. Perhaps this is a result of the general trend in the world towards more rational and scientific explanations of things. We just don't need God to explain the workings of the world anymore, so we have gradually dropped the entire mindset from our thoughts. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre once described this as a, quote, God-shaped hole in the human conscience. It was there practically forever, and then it wasn't. It left a hole that has never been filled, no matter how hard we try to fill it. This was clearly not the case in biblical times. The various words for God in one form or another are the single most common subject words in the entire text. Nothing else even comes close. In what is classically known as the Torah, God comes up virtually everywhere. Sometimes God can be referred to three times in one verse. In addition to stressing how common the notion of God was in the Bible, it also tells us something else. The, the Bible was driving home the point that God was everything. God was not simply another option out there for those who were desperate or needed something to pass the time or to explain away difficult matters. Those were all very useful things, but they weren't why God was so important. That was something else. This week's Parsha zeroes us in on what this was. The Parsha is called Va'et Hanan, a difficult word to pronounce and even more difficult to translate. It means something on the order of, and I pleaded. But this barely scratches the surface of what was intended. In this single word is the heartfelt plea of Moshe to God to allow him to enter the Holy Land, even though the divine decree was that he wouldn't be able to. In the end, his request was denied, and he was unable to fill what was probably his greatest dream. From there, the Parsha goes into a wide variety of subjects. There is no single driving theme, but there is something that seems to be the main subject. Take in mind that this is the Parsha that contains both the second rendering of the Ten Commandments and the crucial declaration of the oneness of God, known as the Shema. There is a lot going on here. Nevertheless, there is this one thing that seems to dominate almost everything that appears in the Parsha. It is the dreaded subject of Avodah Zarah, or idolatry. Other than God, this is probably the most widely and commonly covered subject in the Torah. It comes up frequently in each of the five books, and it appears in one form or another in probably about half the Parshas. It frequently strikes us today as a bit of overkill. It may have been an important issue during biblical times, but it is just not something that is any longer on people's minds. And admittedly, even those who tend to take everything in the Torah quite seriously have some trouble with this. Nobody is particularly concerned with the whole issue of, of idolatry today. They consider it either to be something that no longer really exists or is so dif distant from them that it is not a threat. But there is no getting around the fact that it is all over the place in the Torah. In this week's Parsha, it is one of the major subjects, if not the major subject. We have to understand why it, is so, such a cru why it was such a crucial matter in biblical times and why it has lost almost all of its relevance in our times. Perhaps if we get to the bottom of this, it will shed some light on the more important subject of the relevance of God. 
There are many verses in this week's parsha to quote concerning idolatry. Towards the beginning, we find a brief recap of the experience of receiving the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. This is likely meant as an introduction to the actual retelling of the event later in the parsha. Quote, you approached and stood at the foot of the mountain. The mountain was burning with a fire, reaching to the heart of heaven with darkness, cloud, and mist. Then God spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no image. There was only a voice. A few le verses later, it continues. Watch yourselves very carefully, since you did not see any image on the day that God spoke to you out of the fire at Horeb. You shall therefore not become corrupt and make a statue depicting any symbol, any male or female image, or the image of an animal on earth, any winged creature that flies in the sky, any lower form of land animal, or any animal that lives in the water below the earth. When you raise your eyes to the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, and other heavenly bodies, do not bow down to them or worship them. This theme is repeated a few times in the course of the Parsha. It was obviously a very important message. The question is why? Would it have been so terrible if people decided to make these images of animals or people or, or the heavenly bodies? Couldn't they still believe in God if they also attributed some divinity to other things? The answer to these questions is clearly that there was no room whatsoever for any alternative. It was to be just God from here on in. This very restriction on belief was enshrined at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. What is commonly called the Second Commandment states the prohibition of having any other deities other than God. It wasn't just the making of idols that was the problem. It was the belief itself. If there was anything else within one's range of beliefs, within the scope of things that a person attributed power and ultimate control to, it was a direct violation of this commandment. This stark and highly restrict restrictive belief system is really summed up in the Shema verse, which appears a few chapters later. Hear Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. This simple statement, appearing almost out of nowhere in the Parsha, stands out as the single most important declaration of faith in Judaism. If there is anything all Jews agree upon, it is that this is the central core of Jewish belief. They may not believe it themselves, but they acknowledge that this is what it all boils down to. It is evident from the Torah that this was a major challenge in biblical times. There were all kinds of things that seemed to work on their own without any dependence on the invisible and scarcely knowable God who demanded exclusivity in belief. Every animal, every person, certainly the heavenly bodies, seemed to function perfectly well without any strings attached to this mysterious God who couldn't be found in any place or pinned down to any form. That was the reason for the overwhelming temptation to make images of these things. They appeared to be under their own control. To put them all under the dominion of this deity with a sacred name may have been asking too much. Yet this is exactly what the primary message of the Torah and this week's Parsha states. It can be succinctly stated in a verse from the middle of the Parsha. Quote, You know today and you shall think about it in your mind that Hashem is the God in the heavens above and on the earth below. There is no other. This verse really tells it like it is. Wherever you might think there is something that extends beyond the dominion of God, there isn't. There is no other. Anything else, no matter how convincing it may appear to be independent of God, is not. Even the thoughts in the mind of a person, as free and as, as uncontrollable as they may seem, are really only there because God allows them to be. We may not be completely comfortable with this sweeping statement of belief, but the Torah certainly made a major point in driving it home. Now perhaps we can get back to that delicate matter of the relevance of God in, my, in modern times. The trend towards scientific explanations of everything and the general desire for complete freedom in everything we do certainly has poked a huge hole in the biblical way of seeing things. Nobody today wants to be told that we still need the antiquated notion of God to explain the intricacies of the world. Everybody gets indignant if somebody tells them that they can only think the things they do and go about living the life they live if God allows it. 
This just makes no sense in the modern world. We may not think of ourselves as gods, but we certainly aren't prepared to submit ourselves to the authority of something called God. Bringing it up under anything other than the perfect circumstances is sure to create resentment and ridicule, hence the almost complete avoidance of the subject today. Perhaps we have created our own form of idolatry with this. It may not be the classic biblical idolatry of making statues and bowing to the stars, but it does share the common ground of denying the supreme role of God in our lives. Perhaps we can extend these biblical messages, such as there is no other, to our own times. Is there a possibility, even a remote chance, that we have placed ourselves and our brilliant explanations of everything at the forefront of all that is important and shifted the hidden power that lies behind it out of the picture? Are we really so sure that we are correct in this? Maybe, just maybe, we have fallen for the same trap that those old idol worshippers did. Like them, perhaps we have allowed ourselves to become entranced by the clear picture before our eyes and forgot to look at what causes that picture to be. The general message against idolatry is just as relevant today as it was in biblical times. It is this core idea that there is really nothing other than God. Whether it be a star or a mountain or a person, whether it be an idea or an equation or a desire, all of these may be powerful and all-encompassing. But when we look behind them, when we examine where they came from and to what they owe their existence, we always find that things point in one direction. There is no other. Shabbat Shalom.